All right, Natalia, it's great to have you here at Manufacturing Happy Hour. And I'm excited to dive into uh, what might be the first time we've really dove into medical device manufacturing on this show. So, you know, I want to hear a bit about your story first. You know, throughout your career, you've been involved in medical device manufacturing. What attracted you to this space to begin with? First of all, thanks for inviting me. Super happy to be in the happy hour. Yes, I've been in the medical device space over 18 years now. And I can tell you, um, I've seen how things have evolved, you know, in those 18 years. I wish I can tell you that, you know, since high school, I had this in mind that I was going to work on medical devices. But, you know, I went to school for chemical engineering. And, and right when I was finished in the school, I got this opportunity. Someone offered me a job in medical device, right? And, and I said, you know, they're offering me a job. It's a brand new let's say, um, arena in at least at that time in Costa Rica, where I'm native from. So I took the job, right? And, and, and here I am 18 years later. I think that that was one of the, I would say, nicest opportunities and, and biggest challenges that I had 18 years ago. And one thing, I should say two things we do on this show, we cover a lot of different manufacturing verticals, food and beverage, we, we, we've seen the gamut on this show. And we also, we like to talk about things as if we're you know, happy hour style, as if we're having, let's say, coffees or beverages on the beaches of Costa Rica, for example, right? So if you're having coffee with someone on the beaches of Costa Rica, how do you describe what makes medical device manufacturing unique relative to other manufacturing industries? Right. Uh, and you know what? I'm going to take your word. The next the next podcast should be in Costa Rica with coffee. Okay? <laughs> Deal. <laughs> Deal. <laughs> I think especially after COVID, everyone is super aware of the level of stress that the, the personal that works, you know, doctors and nurses, people that work serving others on the health space, they suffer, right? It's not only that they're overworked, right? It's also that they suffer from a lot of sometimes post-traumatic stress because of those 20, 24 hours at service, right? I, I have a dear friend, he is, he's an emergency doctor, and he said, Natalia, sometimes I feel I am going into a war zone. You know, uh, because, you know, you lose people on the table and then you, you just lost somebody and then somebody came with a gunshot and, and then the next one and the next one. Right. So the uniqueness of medical devices is that we serve a very unique niche of, of customers and users. Right. Most of the people that are served by us. They, they don't they don't choose us by, by by election you know they don't say i'm gonna go and have a, a catheterism today i'm gonna ha go and have a surgery today right most of them they have to go because you know they want to preserve the quality of life uh but but most of them are super nervous they are they are super afraid so in that sense the uniqueness of the medical device is how sensitive you have to be in terms of the population you serve that's number one Number two, just like pharma and, and you know, aviation and, and spaceships, you are a highly regulated industry, right? So it's it's so important that you can that you can have evidence at every step of the way of everything that you have done and that you have done according to what you said you were gonna do, right? And and that means that for many people, when they come from the technology industry, which I love, or the food and drug industry, which I love, sometimes they see the controls a little bit too excessive, right? Which also has a an overhead burden that is a little bit too excessive. But it's a uniqueness also in, in our space. Yeah, I like that you drew the parallels between aerospace as well. I mean, do those do those industries even come close to, to what you have to do in manufacturing? Are those are those the industries that let's say you have that track and trace aspect to it? Or is med device at another level even relative to those? Well, I think it depends. You know, we compare very much with pharma and, and in aviation. I think we, we learn a lot from aviation because, you know, you, you cannot allow to have even one plane in 20,000 that goes down, you know, especially in a flight, mm -hmm. right, with a pool mm -hmm. of people, right? So the level of demand and the level of uh, quality and how they integrate the quality into the process in aviation is something that we relate to with medical device, right? So I think that's, that's one thing. Uh, of course, it's, it's a little bit different the way we manufacture and how we, uh, our, our channel to market, but this is one thing that uh, normally we compare with aviation and aerospace as well. 
and correct me if I'm wrong, did I see that in your career when I looked on LinkedIn, you have a bit of aviation industry experience in addition to medical device? Did I look at that incorrectly? Yeah, I travel. I've used a lot of planes in my life. <laughs> <laughs> but that's as okay. far as my aviation experience. Okay. Okay. I, I I must have seen something different. That's uh, that's my fault there. Well, it, it, this is kind of in line with my next question then, since I misunderstood that aspect of your career. What's one of the most misunderstood aspects about the medical device manufacturing industry, right? You just shared some of the realities of it, but what's maybe one of the realities that people just miss or they aren't aware of in your space? I think what, one of the things is um, how complex it is to make a change within the medical device industry. Uh, and, and when I say complex, I'm not saying impossible or that it should be slow, right? It's just that it's complex, right? Especially when you when you have devices that are regulated by you know competent authorities across the world, right? So if you want to make a change in a raw material, or if you want to make a change in a process, or you want to make a change in the product per se the process is complex, right? I was in a meeting one day with, with some people in, in, in Costa Rica, there's like a local agency that promotes medical devices to come and, and establish in Costa Rica. And we were having conversations similar to this and, and somebody said, I don't understand why you cannot have a new product or a new generation every three to six months. And I said, hey, I will love us to have that, right? But that will mean the amount of, of overhead at this time that we will need to add is going to be super, super big, right? And maybe it's not feasible. So that's one thing. The other thing is that, you know, we have a, some of our products have a unique channel to market, right? And, and that's something that is very specific, especially products that go inside your body. Uh, most of them, the sales happen when the doctor is going to do the procedure. So our salespeople, they're in the in the room with the doctor and they're helping the doctor in the procedure. So it's not a regular salesman, right? It's someone that has a lot of knowledge within the medical uh, industry, the health industry, right? Now, Chris, one important thing for us, the medical device manufacturers, we also have some misconceptions inside, right? The one that I find very common is within my team, I, I run manufacturing sites, right? People think that if we move fast and we embrace operational excellence, Six Sigma, you know, all these kind of things, we're going to break something. Okay. So they say, you know what? I, 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 some of them will tell me operational excellence, Six Sigma. I, I don't think that applies to us. It does, right? At a different speed, but it does, right? And, and I think in terms of manufacturing, it doesn't matter if you are, you know, the food on the drug or aviation, operational excellence, Lean Six Sigma, all these kind of things are the bread and butter if you want to be talking or surviving, you know, in the next 10 to 20 years or so, right? A couple interesting things I heard from that. One, you know, I, I spent some time in the semiconductor industry out in California. That's another spot where I think that industry is very familiar with, hey, you can't just make changes on a whim, right? There's a process to document that. So I'm looking at other industries that, that have those parallels. I like how you described some of the, the, let's say, the misconceptions even within your own industry as well. Great way to answer that. But I think the thing that stuck out the most is someone that was a salesperson, imagining what it's like being in that room with the doctor, thinking of how that's a different, let's say, customer facing experience than other roles since we do have a lot of business development folks that listen to this show i'm sure they're thinking uh making a sales call in the room with the doctors probably a little different than some of their experiences just imagine if you just if you're there in the in the room with the doctor the doctor is going through a procedure and then you put a product and the product does not work just just imagine the level of stress right so that's why quality and, and making sure that Every single product on the medical device industry that we put out in the market works. It's so important, right? Because you are impacting somebody's life, really, right? I think that's a great way to put that into perspective. And to go deeper for the second half of the interview into one of the comments about, hey, making sure that since it's a regulated industry, there are a lot of changes, early involvement of products into design. And that's a topic you're going to be speaking about at the upcoming American Manufacturing Strategies Summit. And I want to dive into this a bit more. So you're speaking on that topic. Can you describe what early involvement of products into design is all about? Let's let's go back to that beach in Costa Rica, right? Described as if we're having coffees in Costa Rica. 
I can tell you this is one of, a, of the closest topics to my heart because when I started 18 years ago, I didn't have all this gray hair, right? So it has come with a price, okay? Experience comes with a price. I think some of us, it, it, despite of the industry we are, we, we can relate to this story about having a great product that our customers love, but we just cannot put it on the market at the rate they need us, right? And then we start having, you know, um, issues with, with the market, we start losing market share, things start getting ugly because of this, right? And in one of the reasons that this is very close to my heart, it has happened to me, especially at the beginning of my career, several times. If you don't involve end-to-end -end experts when you are thinking about a new product, something will break in the, in, the, in the chain, right? I can talk about crazy experiences. You have a product that you sell mostly in Europe, but you source all of it from America, right? So... The, the, the supply chain is crazy, right? You have a product that you sell in America, the supply chain comes all the way from Asia. And, and th those kind of things are difficult. So when, when you are thinking about the product itself and how you're gonna make somebody else's life easier, it can be a doctor, a nurse, or, or an actual patient, right? You, can also, you also need to think how you're gonna put that product in that person's hands, you know, which is the step prior for them to be able to use it, right? So making sure that manufacturing has a seat and a voice at the table of the new product is very important. We can support, and it's not only manufacturing, it has to be quality. It has to be, you know, sourcing, you know, operational material management, logistics, where are we gonna source this procurement? It has to be a group of experienced people sitting down and saying, okay, this is what we want to put in this specific market with this specific qualities, how we're going to make it happen at the rate that the market needs it. Right. You know, I can, I can speak a little bit of the companies I have worked with over the last 18 years. You see how over the these last 18 years, we have been developing controls and processes to make sure everyone we need it's at the table. Right. So um, you can use processes like product life cycle management. You can use processes like, you know, what some companies call early involvement, you know, you bring people, you start putting together value stream mappings and so forth. But the thing is that never forget that in order for a customer or a patient to use the product, you have to put that product physically in their hands on a timely manner. And that's what early involvement, at least for manufacturing, wants to make sure it happens. Well, maybe a bit of a big question around that. Do you, I'd love to pull some stories from your experience, right? Um, and obviously, we don't need to name any company names, but can you share a story from your experience where you felt the rewards of starting early and getting involved early? And then, or maybe you want to start on the flip side, maybe where you experienced the challenges of starting a little later than you would, you would have preferred. I think, you know, that experience sometimes, you know, what I, what I think a smart person learns from his or her experiences, right? A wise person learns, learns from other person's experiences, right? <laughs> I can tell you that unfortunately, sometimes we're very smart, but we're not wise, right? So sometimes it takes one or two of these situations to happen for you to actually understand why you need to be involved here. I can tell you uh, in one of the companies that I worked for, and this is a success story, we had a product that was a stellar product. Everybody loved the product. We could just not put the product in the doctor's hand. And at some point, or in the user's hand, and at some point, you know, they were like, you know, I'm going with other companies because maybe the product is not that cool. You know, it's, it's not so powerful, but I can rely on them. They are always here, right? And I think we, we heard that loud and clear, and it was probably 10 years ago. And, and we said, okay, what do we need to do to increase our uh, resilience and our and our uh, performance? You know, how how can we be that person, that that contact or that uh, supplier that this uh, specific customer needs? And, and he said, you know, I love your product. I just want this product to be here within 48 hours every time I ask for it. Okay, the the, the ask is clear. So we went back with the next generation of the product, and that was one input. Okay, we have to be ready to support across the globe any request within 48 hours so instead of being a late requirement it was part of the design of the mm -hmm. product right so when we were sourcing materials we thought remember we have always to be able to put in the user hands within 48 hours right it took us a little bit of iterations you know because 
we, we tend to go back to the ways that we feel safe, right? And then we had somebody saying, well, let's launch it like this and then we will do it. And we say, no, that's why we're doing things different now, right? We want this 48 hour request to be part of the design of the product. And we launched and it was a success and it has been a success since then, right? So those are the kind of, of winnings that you can get, right? If you, if you include those kind of things that people might think are not requirements of the product into the early stages of design, you can meet that. Yeah. Wow. That, so I, I'm, I haven't been an engineer for a really long time, but that's what I got my degree in. But that re story really resonates with me because I think young engineers, when they're going through engineering school, there's a, a tendency to really just focus on the tech and the design. But you just shared a story where something very tangible and very logical, right? Hey, I need this within 48 hours influences design decisions way down the line because you've mentioned supply chain a couple times. If you don't take that into consideration early, there's no way you're going to hit the customer needs, especially if you were describing supply chain from Europe to America, like those things differ. And, and actually, I have a question along those lines as well. Since you are serving different countries, since you are serving people around the globe, how does, and maybe speak in generalities, because I imagine this could go very deep, how does medical device manufacturing differ around the world? And how do you manage the different requirements from country to country? This is not a uniqueness of medical device. I think when you have, when you work in global companies that have global products, you find mm -hmm. that cultures and, and preference among cultures are very important, right? So I will say that the one thing that you need to do when you design a, process, a product as well is when I was talking about this board of SMEs, right? Marketing and sales experts are important, right? Because, uh, and of course, everything that is happening in, in, in the world now, right? 10 years ago, sourcing everything from China was, was the way to go, right? Today, maybe it's, it's not that, that after COVID and all the things that we're seeing, we see many companies saying, well, I'd rather have my supply chain closer to, to where I manufacture and to where I serve, right? So what I mean is that in the last 10 years, so many things have changed in the world. I will say the one thing that you need to be aware of, especially in the medical device environment, is you have regulated agencies in each country or in each region that you're working on, right? You need to be close to them. You need to understand what they ask from you and how you're going to meet that. What is the presence that they need you to have in, in, the, in the countries you're serving? And when it comes to product itself, and I think I will speak openly about the Japan market. Japan market is a very attractive market for all of us, right? But the, Jap the, the Japanese market is very demand when it comes to product quality, right? So for them, when you start talking about percentages of failure rates, they just they just leave the table, right? They want sigma levels. They want five sigma. They want six sigma, right? So when you're putting a product in Japan and when you are setting up a supply chain for Japan, it's the design requirements are very different from, let's say, I'm going to use Costa Rica, right? Costa Rica, we're a small country, you know, um, we tend to be a little bit more, I will say, relaxed in our approach in many things, right? So those kind of things is not only, I will say, for medical devices, but it's across the world. The other thing that you need to understand is there are some countries that will not allow products that are manufactured in a specific country. So you also have to have that in mind when you, when you set up your manufacturing footprint. Where are you going to manufacture and to whom you're going to sell? right? Because that can also impact, you know, your presence in several markets as well. Great answers. And I love that you brought it in because you're absolutely right. I mean, this isn't just a medical device thing. I think of when I think of more regulated industries, I tend to think that they might be unique in that regard, but it's a manufacturing reality for almost any product. That things differ from country to country. You know, I guess I have another question, kind of future looking as we get towards the end of this conversation. You know, I feel like mass customization or manufacturing is getting more and more customized for the consumer. And in your perspective, that that is that the case for med device as well? Of course, of course. You know, when you when you start ha having closer conversations with your customers, you find that one product might be um, might have a different use according to the market. You know, the intended use is one thing, but how mm -hmm. the 
how the, the customer use it to get to that intended use is a little bit different, right? So you need to take that into consideration and you need to start, you know, making sure that you have a flexible yet, I will say effective supply chain to be able to give those different flavors, right? There are things that you, and, and you have to be very balanced here, Chris, because there's a book that is called Shift and it says how to change when change is hard. But if you read the first five pages of that book, it's very interesting because they say they have found that the more options you have in front of you when you're making a decision, the more difficult it is to make a decision, right? So we need to make sure that we give that level of customization to the customer that is just right for them, but also right for us, right? Because if you have, I'm going to say, uh, let's say we sell one of those big equipments in, in a hospital and you have 2,500 different colors, right? Then you, your supply chain is just become so, so big and so difficult to, man, to, to manage that I can guarantee you that you're going to miss the color because, you know, the, the, option, the opportunities are endless, right? So customization is very important, but it also has to come with some, I will say, common sense when you do that, right? I love that balance. Makes a lot of sense. By the way, for anyone listening out there, I'll have a link to shift in the show notes for anyone that might be interested in diving into that a bit more. Um, you know, one, one of the last questions I have uh, around this topic is, hey, where do you see med device going in the near future, med device manufacturing? Or what are some trends maybe that that are really front of mind for you? I think, you know, um, going into a, a faster, easier, simpler way of manufacturing things, right? And in making the process of transforming raw materials into finished goods in terms of manufacturing, even more fail-proof than today. And our, we're going to use automation, you know, new technologies that are coming in the market. I will say that in the last 18 years that I have been in this, in this industry, the level of automation and, and artificial intelligence that we have embedded into manufacturing has allowed us to grow faster. I would say probably three, four times faster than we used in the past, but also with uh, more reliable outcomes. So who knows what the next amazing gig is going to be in IT, right? In, in, the, in the world, in the space of technology. But what I will say is we not only medical device, but we manufacturing people, we need to be open to those changes. And not only open, we need to make sure that we are at the front of the line developing the next technology with those smart guys that are developing, right? So we can tell them what do we need, what do we want, you know, how they can use whatever they're thinking they're going to develop for, for our benefit. And we need to be in front and sitting next to them because we need to make sure that we can develop this in the proper way, you know? We need to make sure it's, it's approved by all the competent authorities. You need to make sure it's safe and so forth. So... That's the one thing I see. The other thing I see is we're going into a model, like you say, a more customized model, right? So we are also, I'll say the connection with the customer and how the customer is going to order in the future, the, the ordering pattern is going to change. And we need to make sure that, you know, with all the, you know, big data analytics that we have capacity now, you know, with, with all these kind of things, we use them in order to make the life easier for our customers and patients, right? Uh, we need to give them, and we're doing that, you know, across the medical device industry. You see how we're using aggregated data in a very, uh, we'll say, safe and confidential way to help the, the health community to know what is the next big thing that we're going to see 10, 20 years from today and how we can be ready for that, right? I want to end this with a quote. I don't know whether I read this quote, but it says, the first patient that will be cured from, from Alzheimer is out there today. Mm -hmm. Right. So that means that we know that we're working on that. And, and today, maybe it's just a dream, but 10, 15 years from today, it might be a reality. Right. So what I think is in that sense, we need to use the data or all, all the big data and the analytics capacity we have developed today to understand what other things need to be solved in the future and how we can not only solve them, but prevent them from happening. Mm. Wow, great way to end it, pulling in, like, let's say, digital transformation, data, all of those other aspects of manufacturing, but ultimately relating it back to the person that's receiving those treatments at the very end of it, right? It is great to know that, hey, the, the first person that we find a cure for Alzheimer's is already out there, right? And bring it, really bringing it home in that capacity. 
Natalia, I appreciate you jumping on the show today. Is there anything you wish I would have asked you that I hadn't? No, Chris, I think that the one thing that you're owning me is to have this conversation really at the beach. That's the only thing I can <laughs> it, will improve, it will improve our conversation. But no, thank you very much. I'm thrilled to be here. And, you know, we all talk from, we all speak from our experiences and our, you know, the, the way that we have lived life and, and looking forward to comments and, you know, to people to open discussions about we, what we just said. You know, I like to hear what others have to say about this. It doesn't have to be, yes, I agree. I love the ones that said, well, you know, maybe you have missed this, right? That's when we, when we grow the most. I love that. That's the best way to think about it. We've got a really active listener community on LinkedIn, especially. I'll have a link in the show notes to connect with you, Natalia, so that uh, people can continue that conversation with us afterwards, because I, I do look forward to hearing uh, to how this one plays out. So again, thank you so much for being on the show. And next time I'm flying down to Costa Rica for this. That's a promise. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> thank you. 